two with the Mr. Fabulous James Labors. I want to, you're not even the guru maker. You're not the lazy coach anymore. What, where are we now? Maybe I'm just happy being me. <laughs> <laughs> are you living on purpose? <laughs> no, my company's called <laughs> I'm being more and more authentic now. Yeah, my name will do. It's James. <laughs> it's James. Maybe we can get you down to a one-liner yeah, where it's, 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 ju- just it's such James. Nothing, just, it's just a James. feeling. It's just James. Anyway, <laughs> this fabulous man, if you missed part one, please go back and watch part one um, of the show because it was a really broad but deep conversation around what's going on in the personal development space and mm. we're continuing that conversation can i just now. say by the way very quickly yeah. those kind of five challenges yeah i don't know whether they are like the five biggest no, but they're the five most alive in me at the moment yeah. Do you know what i mean i wanted oh, to say that there's because... more than five challenges like you yeah. can never you can never possibly <laughs> summarize it down i just think just every that, expert's but... got to like here's the biggest and then it's like next year they've got a new biggest yeah. and it's like well and next look, week there's a new one because yeah. it depends what's <laughs> what's going on within but you. But those, f- those are the five that feel the most alive in me at the moment, oh, I would great. say. Yeah. They were fabulous. I wanted to take the conversation on to part two because I, mm-hmm. I am fascinated with what you've been doing the last couple of years during mm. lockdown and um, your exploration into not just the journey of the last 20 odd years that you've been in the space and all the hundreds of people that you've worked with, but actually... You've been rewinding time mm. in terms of where this has all come from, and you've created yourself. I'm going to call it your book porn collection. Um, this incredible, incredible library of first edition books that I can't wait to come round and see, oh. just to be in, in the presence of them because they, I love it. They, they, you know, it's almost like the the Bibles of of where a lot of this began. Like you were talking yes. earlier in part one. Um, you know, this pinnacle of the industry, but yeah. actually, which I'm sure you'll unpack, so much of this has been around for millennia, or yes. centuries and, and millennia in some cases as far back as mm. books go. So I'm intrigued because, uh, yeah, I've seen the collection. What have you discovered inside this incredible... What are some of the books you've got? I've got too many questions. Okay. What are some of the books that you've so got for, that everyone's just going to be like, thinking, completely what, what, like, oh. Yeah, what do we mean about this library? Well, at the beginning of lockdown... Um, I started to buy first edition, but more than that, first edition, first printing. So literally the first couple of that, you know this, yeah. like when you print a book, the first printing is the, like the first couple of thousand, three to five thousand that they ever print. Yeah. And that's a first printing. And if it does well, They'll print the some publisher more. will go, all right, we'll do some more. Yep. Yeah. And what I got intrigued with was um, collecting because in lockdown, people were selling stuff because they wanted money. And so what I found was it didn't start off altruistically. I, just, <laughs> I, I, I wanted to get a copy of Self-Help by Samuel Smiles, which is the first. I, it was written in 1859. What? And it was, and it's sort of, it, it's the first, I would say, commercialization of personal development. Wow. So it, quite a young industry, really, when yeah. you think about it, you know. It's not even 200 years old. Um, but uh, even that, though, I think is probably shocking to many because obviously yeah. we've only been living in this era. We're like, mm. oh, this is a thing. That's no, it's been not to say now. people weren't sharing wisdom before that. No, but absolutely. they weren't doing it for money. Yeah. They weren't doing it to get paid for it. Yeah. Not really. I mean, you know, there may be a few cases, but then they're not very well documented. And the there was, a you know, the philosophers going back thousands of years, as you say, you know, would, would speak and share. But... Uh, it, it wasn't usually a commercial thing. Yeah. It wasn't something that people did to make money to live. Yeah. That really started a, a good place to sort of say, when did that start? When mm-hmm. did people start to share their good, what they knew and get paid for it? Well, it's about 1859. Well. And it's at the publication of a book called Self-Help by a, a Scottish, a Scottish, generally somebody who failed at law, failed at various things in life. And, um, he wrote a lot of books. Samuel Smiles wrote some books where he would, um, he wrote a book all about the famous engineers at the time. Um, and, uh, you know, he basically was asked to come and speak at, now in the 1850s and 60s in, the, in, in England, people, there was a much more of an elitist sort of system, you mm-hmm. know, going on. And, um, people of lower and lesser means 
if they wanted to learn stuff and they were adults, they, I mean, you, you just couldn't. Go. You just couldn't. And so what people would do is they would get together in these like cooperative groups and they would share stuff. So you'd get, and it was, back then it was mostly like men a meet, doing like this. A meet but yeah, it would be a meetup group. So you'd get somebody who'd come along who's a little better at maths. you get somebody come along who knows a French. you get somebody along who knows a little bit about how to carpentry and they would all get together usually every week or every month mm. and they would teach each other stuff they would share each the stuff with each other yeah right like yeah. it is where like people come together in these collaborative groups and then as those evolved over a couple of years they would invite speakers in and Samuel Smiles went to speak at one of these groups about what he had observed and learned from being around these very well-known engineers mm -hmm. Um, this was when the railways were being put down, obviously, in the, you know, the, the height of the industrial, you know, revolution. And he came and he sort of shared what he knew about exceptional people. And then he sort of made that the foundation for the book Self-Help. Now, obviously, I've just done a, a very, a very hard, quick yeah, yeah. paraphrase job there. So you can, you can find out more probably just from Wikipedia. <laughs> but the, it's, with the publication of Self-Help, we saw the first commercialization of the these you know somebody earned money from telling people that they can you know Think they can improve it. their lives you yeah. know and um, that book did really really well yeah. like really well phenomenally well and it and it kind of kick started the industry and I got a copy I got a, a, a an 1860 copy it's falling apart um, so it's a first edition it's not a first printing but it's a first edition. Because it wasn't a first printing, I got a bee in my bonnet and I was like, I want the first printing. <laughs> I'm a little bit, my fiance, who is autistic, thinks that I have traits of neurodiversity <laughs> because I will fixate. So I will get stuck on something and I'm like, oh man, I've got to have it, I've got to have it, I've got to mm. have it. And I, it's all I think about. So then I went looking around during lockdown for like, I've got to find the copies edition. of these books, right? So I got one, and then I'm suddenly like, I don't want just one. I want to get, I want all the first edition, first printings <laughs> of the entire industry. And I was like, James, if you're going to do this and not go bankrupt, like, because <laughs> these books are not cheap no, at all. No, they're not. They're hundreds and a couple of cases, thousands of pounds to buy each book. And um, I spent a lot of money on these books. And I had to put boundaries around it. So I said, okay, I'm going to take it up to the internet. Because the minute the internet comes along and self-publishing comes along, so. it goes, there's so many books now. Yeah, yeah. And to get, you know, uh, first printings of every book, it would be ridiculous. And it's when we saw an explosion anyway in, you know, with the internet of people oh, self-publishing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I was like, okay, I'm going to take it up to the internet age. And I did get a first printing, though. I did go slightly into the internet age with a first copy of The Secret by Rhonda Byrne. Yeah. Um, it is a monumental book. It's a monumental book. And I got like one of the first thousand ever printed. And I, and, and I thought, well, this is wonderful. Now, the reason I like it, the reason I like getting these books, because I think this will set the, the foundation for, for, for this kind of project and hopefully be of, of help to other people out there thinking of coming into this industry mm -hmm. or have an interest in this industry. What I feel when, I'm, when I've got these first printings in my hand is, I'm holding an artifact. The people publishing this book, they didn't know whether this would sell or not. Mm -hmm. They probably had hesitation and weren't and were wondering and worried and thinking, God, will this sell? Does anybody like me? Will they like this mess? You know, all yeah. of that stuff. A lot of these first printings, the person was a complete unknown or was only known in very small circles, yeah. you know. And that to me is fascinating and it's a great reminder. It's almost like a touchstone, an actual touchstone for me with these books because it reminds me that these, these heroines and heroes we look up to, at one point they were worried. They were maybe just as worried as you might be that like, oh, will people like my message and all that yeah. kind of thing. It's like when you're holding it, I for one, you talk about energy, I really feel that and I'm like, it's a reminder to me, to my clients, to my students, you know, to anyone that follows me. It's 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 a reminder to them. It's like, you you these people did not let that hesitance mm -hmm. or self doubt stop them from putting out a product. And the one off thing is, up until only what 
30 years ago, 40 years ago, the book was really the only product. Yeah. It was the only product. Until like, cassettes, t- until the plastic box sets. Well, Earl came Nightingale out. was one of the first to do in like the, I want to say the 50s, I could have that wrong. Um, he was one of the first to actually put out vinyl. Mm. So he would record, he was a, he was a radio wow. personality, you know, and he was one of the first to record himself and put it out as vinyl, you know, these talks and stuff. But that was incredibly hard. Mm. It wasn't like everyone could do that. The expense yeah. before cassette, yeah. audio cassette, everything was a book. It was book. So everything really started to change in like the, the 60s, 70s, 80s. Prior to that, nothing. And even so, this is why Nightingale Conant, who were actually in 2002 mm. the first company I went to, I, I actually worked with, and a lot of their, their big names and gurus. But Nightingale Conan, Simon and Schuster, you know, we, we recognize these names later publishing houses like Hay House. Yeah. Um, this is why they dominated because if you had a book but you wanted to get out your spoken word, you had to go to one of them. Yeah. You had to go to a publishing house um, because they could do it at a, a relatively good cost for you. They could take that chance and that risk for you where almost nobody else could. Yeah. To me, that is fascinating and then if you wanted to get on tv well you had to do what tony robbins did you had to you had to be picked up by another company that i worked with called guffy renker i produced an infomercial for guffy renker it was guffy renker who picked up tony robbins and put him on tv all day long wow and it's amazing to me when people go oh this is so hard in this industry i'm like you don't even know we've got it so easy (laughs) You've got a phone, you've got the internet. Yeah, it's like you can pick up your phone and literally go, oh, I'm going to do a multi-video course and it's online yeah, literally yeah. next week. Yeah. And people go, oh, I don't know how to do it. Really? You could press three buttons and be broadcasting live and you're whinging to, to me about yeah. you don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not the problem here. Yeah. That's not a problem here. You know, when you look at like what Tony did and that Gutty Renka put him on TV all day long. There was never a point he wasn't on TV. You know, he was on a one of the channels, I think, for like five years nonstop. And that was it. That was, you know, it was very, very difficult. Or you do what Wayne Dyer did, which was literally doing a book tour, going around, going on The Tonight Show, going around, just doing, being, living in your car, trying to get your book sold. And that's what, that that's was it. What, that's what they did. That's all you had. Yeah. So these artifacts, to me... It's wonderful collecting the old ones. You know, um, I've got... What's what's some of the names you've got? Okay, so I've got... You would love this one. I've got the three-volume set of... uh, By H.P. Blavatsky, who is the Russian lady who effectively started the New Age movement. Wow. And... What's that called? um, It's called The uh, The Secret Doctrine. Okay. Volumes one, two, and three. Wow. And these were written in the 1800s. She was... What a phenomenal woman. I mean, the the depth and the comprehension in these texts, you'll go mad when you touch them. You'll just be like, <laughs> you're um, I've got um, uh, uh, Pushing to the Top but, uh, who, by, I'm going to forget all their names now, um, the guy who was the motivator and the kind of the, the inspiration for Think and Grow Rich, Napoleon Hill. And uh, his name's Orvet Svet. Uh, funny name. Yeah. Hard to pronounce. Um, I've got, uh, what else have I got? As a Man Thinketh. I've got Think and Grow Rich. I've got How to Win Friends, friends and Influence People, First Printings. You know, these these books but that have sold now tens of millions. Tens of millions, yeah. And are, and are in libraries of Congress where they go, these are in the top 20 most influential books of all time. You know, mm-hmm. How to Win Friends and Influence People. Now, this guy was on the speaking circuit before then. Yeah. He was doing little trainings for rooms full of dozens of people, teaching them presentation skills. Wow. Um, he wasn't a complete unknown, but he wasn't Massive. a globally known name. He writes this book. And again, holding that one and going, oh, this was one of the first few thousand ever printed. Mm. And you hold it and you go, did he even know? Could he even could Carnegie even have known that he would become such a a, a foundation for our industry mm. when he wrote it? That it goes on and on. 
So I've got, I may even have to refer to the picture on my phone in a second, but it goes all the way up until I've got, um, I'm okay, you're okay, games people play. So I touch into sort of psychology and psychodynamics. Um, I've got Louise Hay first printing of You Can Heal Your Life. That that book was one of my one of my first in understanding that there was a whole world but like that that book's monumental for yeah. me some 20 yeah. 22 years ago. That's insane. Um, this little paperback, Lesser. right? This little paperback. Yeah, You'll love it's this, a, right? a yellow, yellow, yellow book and I've got, and it's on the back. It's got a little cover picture of her, really yep. young, yep. and it just says, "Oh, she teaches so and so," and and yeah. and it looks like a kid did it. Yeah. And but, but, you go. But, she would become the empress of this publishing empire. Who knew? I've got goosebumps all over. And now. of course, she picked up the beacon from H.P. Blavatsky. Yeah. So when you read the read the Secret Doctrine, mm-hmm. now you've got to remember this is what to me is so magical is that that in some of these cases the risks these people took, because this wasn't that long after the witch trials. We're still within. Yeah. We're like. Maybe a century of the witch trials, yeah. And there's this cra- crazy mm-hmm. Russian woman who is saying stuff that has nothing to do with religion, yeah, that is sort of about spirituality. So, there is this we see this breaking of religion, which had for thousands of years been the like, if you examine if yourself, you, it's the through only, the mirror of through a higher this door, power. Yeah. this window, yeah, that's through, it. Power, through this window, of, there's a higher power, yeah, and what she was able to do was to say, don't be so quick. I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but like that, she was kind <laughs> I, of going. I'm quoting words. Yes, I'm words quoting. She don't says. be so quick to, you know, uh, but, you know, assign everything to a higher power. There's a power within you. Yeah. That was huge. That had been. And it's not from the church and it isn't a religion. No offense to anyone with religious philosophies, but I think this is, this is the thing that I love about the personal development space is that it's it's non-denominational. It's just, it's you. It's about finding that mm. power within you. It's not follow this person, that person, this person, that person. It's all about finding that presence within yourself. And, and, you see, and I we think s- that's where the empowerment lies. 100%. And we still, but you see, we still get, there's a massive Judeo-Christian hangover in our industry. Yeah. That I even find when I'm working with people, I'm like, even, we were talking earlier about how yeah. in part one about you know what's the, the 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 needs and the ego that we bring to wanting to be a coach or a trainer or a healer or a practitioner or a thought leader or an author or a speaker in this industry and it's like well a lot of people still are kind of cloaked in this judeo christian archetype which is you will be the savior of all these people yeah. and it's you they've been waiting for and what what a lot of people have is this kind of unconscious assumption that they are this kind of savior yeah and that it's only them yeah and and so even though they are going the powers within you they are positioning themselves as this external power for other people and it's like a lot of that is this judeo-christian cloak Mm -hmm. you know that everyone's still wearing uh, so one of the things I have to I, I say to my clients real early on is I'm a, I'm like get used to the fact that all of your customers will have other people they look up to yeah they'll have other people they follow they'll have other people they might love more than you they might like them more than you yeah. and they go I can see all their reactions mm, as they're like well I'm not sure about this it's like well <laughs> they will be careful of that savior within you you know the kind mm. of the rescuer the you know this and archetype of that's a huge part to heal like yeah. that's what we were talking oh, about in time. part one yeah. And again, another big philosophy on one of the other podcasts, I'm sure, the the drama triangle of, like, where are you stepping in? Are, mm. Because, yeah, when we're unhealed, we're coming from one of one of three disempowered places that the rescuer, we're coming in from, well, I call them the pusher, the puller, and the protector. They're the mm. three of the pusher. You're pushing your energy out on everybody else. The puller, you're the victim and everything's going wrong for you. Um, or the protector, the rescuer, riding mm. in on your horse, like, mm. da, 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 da. I'm here to save the day. Let me sort everything out on the planet. And truly, like, I really had to work through that. My, yeah. Even my early years, um, from when originally I met you, when I was doing the online marketing, social media, there was a saviour 
part yeah, like yeah. I want to change I want to change the world and yeah. I still have that philosophy I know I want to change the world but it was coming from the I need to tick that box in order to feel good enough place rather than actually not I want to save the world I, I want to show people how to find yeah. find that place within but it, it, we it's evolve. a part of us like, that's we, always we, going like why do you want to, why do you want to save the world in well it, 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 it's when we can come face to face with the truth which is like because I hope in so doing, I might just save myself. Yes. You know, it's like, but no one just will say ever it. say that. There you go. Yeah, we're just, we've like, just said yeah, it. Fessed up. <laughs> we've fessed up. We've fessed up. Because I'll save myself. And that's the old adage, though. We teach what yeah. we need to learn. I, I do not profess to have everything in my life, like, totally all of my shit. Have you got all your shit sorted? Totally. Totally. totally like, everything. Except so my don't. dress sense. <laughs> <laughs> Not that and my hair, which is still really scruffy, but anyway, um, no, it's it's uh, and the wonderful thing, but but we also owe a great deal to religion because Massively. it it uh, uh, and a lot of the the pivotal, a uh, great book I've got by um, Russell Cromwell is Acres of Diamonds, mm -hmm. and this was written in about eighteen ninety, and this this book is heavy, like they printed it on something different. It's wonderful, beautiful book. And um, it was one that, um, <laughs> there's a story around it involving my darling, darling fiance who bought me a copy for Christmas, but it wasn't an early enough edition. <laughs> I saw, or it, it was at the time. You didn't give she it back. She saw it. You no, didn't no, give the present back. Hear me you? out, hear me out. <laughs> I saw an earlier one on eBay because I told you I get fixated and I saw an earlier edition. I didn't know she'd got me this for Christmas, right? But I had said, oh no, I did, I said to her, few months before I'd said listen if you are thinking of Christmas presents I can see this on eBay I don't think it's there's a lot of competition for it but it's a really early edition of Acres of Diamonds which is this wonderful story it's where we first see um metaphor and 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 uh, this the, the 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 this kind of wonderful long storytelling that we would see come to popularity through books like The Celestine Prophecy, mm -hmm. which I got a first printing of as well. <laughs> and, you know, the, but Acres of Diamonds is where we see this wonderful book-long story that is used to change minds and change mm -hmm. ideas and feelings and all these kind of things. And I, and, I, and I said to her, I said, darling, if you want to present that one. But then between then and Christmas, I saw an even earlier edition and I bought it. And I'd forgotten that I'd said, buy me this for Christmas. So on Christmas Day, she goes, ta-da! And I go, oh, shit. I'm really sorry. <laughs> so it's a big story yeah. around Acres of Diamonds. But this is... So we see a lot of that. Then I've, I've also got books by... Um, there's a book by a, 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 a silent film actor called uh, Douglas Fairbanks. The name may ring a bell in, in some of you. And Douglas Fairbanks, great actor, you know, was, was huge, was the kind of... the the Johnny Depp, the Brad Pitt of our time, right now. And um, he wrote a book called Laugh and Live. I may have that the wrong way around. Live and Laugh, Laugh and Live, one of those. This is one of the first times that we see a celebrity mm -hmm. doing it. Now, we see that all day long now, right? You know, we got we talked about earlier, you know, uh, um, uh, with what's-his-face, Russell... Russell Brand. Russell Brand, you know, doing <laughs> things like face? that. And we saw other, you know, we see other celebrities sort of Stepping creeping, into the space. Creeping yeah. in because they're... The, the lines are blurred now between the industries, you know. And people think, oh, God, uh, you know, I've, I've had people go, oh, why are all these comedians or actors now coming into space? And I'm like, it's been happening a long time. Yeah. You know, and you've got this book written by an actor of the time that's really just talking about why it's so important to laugh and to, to fully be in the now and experience it. And so the other thing that building this museum, this kind of library museum has done is shown me the cyclical nature of the industry and how these trends do come round. Yeah. You know, and what what have you seen? What are, what are the trends like? What do you mm. see sitting behind this? All of it, because again, if you missed part one, go back and watch part one. But in part one, you talked about this. You know, the, there is this hierarchical. You know, the people at the top. Yeah. And yes, people are going out regurgitating a lot of the things that we've learned because actually, it's just become such a massive part of our our consciousness now mm. you know the, the secret the law of attraction uh, Rhonda Bryan has a lot to answer for in terms of it going global and it's now something mm. that almost everyone has heard of even if they're not necessarily mm. into the space it's 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 usual it's normal to talk about manifesting and being able to call those things in so it's almost hard to delete that from your 
awareness because they just become part of what you know. What have what do you see across your hundred and fifty year library, mm. hundred and however many years library? What do you see coming back again now, or where do you see that we need to maybe return to? Yeah, I think to see those trends, you actually have to go further back to before it became a business, before okay. it became commercialized. So when you go back to like even you go back multiple thousands of years to like Confucius and you start to see this was, now you're in my world the world right. of eastern medicine but this, is this like, is, that's my, that's but this my is one of the first place. places that we see the idea of family um as a as, as the, the it's one of the first times that we hear about as without so within mm -hmm. but that you know if you want to change your community or the world start with the family now that you can trace that directly back to this time period in the east yeah. you know where it was like well you know it's, it's there were some that, crazy yeah. things it was a very warlike time there was a lot more conflict and it, who knows what what life must have been like then but the idea one of the first times that the idea was talked about that like well work on your family before you work on everything else yeah, just work know. on yourself first Self, then family family then everything else as, yeah. as in and as in and, and yeah. outwards and and then obviously you have the 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 stoics and so forth and we often go back to that i think with a kind of an idealized kind of like oh better times i don't know i i wonder we've seen those play out those become popular again i think ram das brought with Be Here Now, which I got a first edition of that recently. <laughs> it's like literally watching it. I've got a first edition of I love that. It. I got a I love first it. edition of it's, that. They're like toys. It's like I'm getting, <laughs> I'm completing my collection, right? But what I found as I started this collection is it, I thought originally it would be very clean and simple. It would just be like starting in 1859. There we go. There's all the books. But you start to see the way multiple disciplines and areas and fields of thought and science have have touched on this industry. I talked about with self-help and Samuel Smiles' book. He had a, a, a huge interest in uh, engineering mm. and the engine, the great engineers of the of the Industrial Revolution. And so, when w you hear experts, even nowadays, we still see this. Where I had a program a couple of years ago called Freedom Engineering, yeah. and like we often now still think about things in this using engineering metaphors and it's like well it's still an echo of that mm. and so i go back ostensibly where i think it we had what would become the personal professional spiritual development industry it starts with the enlightenment yeah it starts with us coming out of this dark ages into a place of uh, after the Black Death, you yeah. know, and after after huge hardship hit the world, um, millions, tens of millions of people dying, we come into a time where uh, uh, of of literal enlightenment, you know, mm -hmm. where we start to look at science and we like start to see our place in the world and and a lot of those themes that were born back then and then on into the the kind of the romantic period as mm -hmm. well of the of the of the 1800s the uh, late 1700s the 1800s in tandem with the industrial revolution coming comes this i would say this this uncoupling of my place in the world and my relationship with that and religion i was about to say and religion because yeah. religion was was obviously a big yeah. piece of the puzzle back then yeah, it was. And that and we have science to thank for that as well, because science gave us some factual basis for being able to to also uncouple yeah. from religion and go, well, the, we, we were understanding more about the world. We're understanding more about the, the, the micro world as well and what we're made up of and mm -hmm. all these things as we're, we're able to grind glass to a place thanks to the Industrial Revolution, where we can see beyond just what, yeah. you know, before then we couldn't see anything smaller than a, a, a hair's breadth, you know, those kind of things. And I think it's, so a lot of things were happening all at once that enabled us to 
to have more time to think as yeah. well, to have more time to consider our place in the world. And then you get these branches. I'm, I'm currently in the process of like a, like a detective's murder board, you know, with the red pieces of string, trying to piece together some of the greatest thinkers, you know, of, of that period and their, their influence on how we still think. Yeah. And my, my, my grand conclusion is a lot of the things that we, whoops, excuse me, kicking the microphone, my grand conclusion, um, is that many of the things that we're now thinking about as if no one's ever heard of them were being considered and thought about a couple of hundred years ago, a couple of thousand years ago. And, but that's not to say that there isn't room for nuance. And I think that's, I think the rewards these days don't go to somebody who has the newest idea that no one's ever heard of. If anything, I don't think the rewards go to those people. I think the rewards go to those who help us understand something we already know but in a way we've never heard before in yeah. a deeper way in a deeper way yeah. something that you inherently well, that's know what within you've yourself done with but energy that's, that's what i think you've done with energy it's what i love about especially when you you very kindly last year helped me through a personal challenge and gave me an experience of eam what i was very cognizant of when we were doing that was that this uh, you know I spent a lot of my teens sort of experimenting with energy and Tai Chi and all sorts of Mm. things. And it never really, for me, got beyond a feeling. Yeah. And I read a lot of, you know, a lot of literature by a lot of smart people about energy. And, you know, to one degree or another, some people were able to make it practical. Other people kept it firmly in the conceptual and philosophic and that's fine. But also what I find is there's always room. Yeah. If, if, as long as we're willing to dig deeper rather than just broaden out or go, oh, here's something completely new. If we're willing to go deeper and examine the nuance of something, mm. that's why there's room for everybody in this yeah, industry. Totally. And, and to linking back to what I said earlier, the problem why so many people, the biggest challenges are when you just say the same things get into hierarchy with somebody else's wisdom, it's like, well, you literally halt nuance. Yeah. Because all you're doing is you're just going, what so-and-so says, I say. Yeah. Rather than it's like, no, get... What else is there about this? That's where my journey with this began because I... My personal journey... Um, with with energy and healing was... Began when I was 17, similar to you, like, working through my own personal shit. And actually... I was so frustrated because all I was hearing was the same thing from people yeah. time and time again. Didn't matter whose books I was picking up. It was like, you have to look within and, you know, it's it's all within you and just follow your heart and you can, you know, you can heal yourself from anything. And it's like, awesome. All those things are true. And absolutely, yes, I believe them. But how the bleep, 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 bleep. How, how, how do, how do I do that? Because mm. I'm not, I'm not someone that sits down and, and you know, can tune in and meditate and travel off with my angels i'm not a ting Sha bells kind of person all power to people who are i'm actually really real for a spiritual coach i'm i'm really grounded i'm actually very practical um i'm really big picture but i'm also very linear like show me the steps how do i make this part of mm. what i do and there were so many other people that they want they want that connection but it's finding a way of being able to take all of this amazing information from mm. so many of the books that we've learned and find a way to put it into practice that's that's doable mm. without having to necessarily become um you know a, a monk who can is practicing meditation for three years like how do i just feel better today mm. how do i feel better now how do i free myself from all of this stuff that i know i'm carrying but i can't put my finger on mm. like talk therapy isn't helping me just talking about it isn't helping me. Just meditating isn't helping me. Just declaring to the universe that I want a million pounds isn't fucking helping me. What do I do? Mm. And that was where my journey began. And it wasn't until I understood the world through the eyes of energy and the bits that were missing, missing pieces of the puzzle. I, I probably had a bit of room, a little bit like your murder board, <laughs> like trying to piece this stuff together. Mm. Um, and I, I do clearly remember where everything from EAM originally came together but I think that's the magic and you you touched on it earlier is really 
every, everything we're all doing is just reminding people of the true nature of who they are because it's been clouded by so many other things that happen throughout our lives and I think that's the gift that this industry can really bring to the world right now um where do you this is a, with everything that's happening in the world because the world has changed a lot is changing where do you see this space this industry playing a part in well, it depends how deep down the rabbit hole we want to go yeah. um I think the last two years has, has massively shaken a lot a lot of people, woken a lot of people up to the things that are really important in life. Mm. I think it scared the shit out of a lot of people because all of the things that they were working towards or things that they thought were important now don't feel as important and actually they've realised the deeper meaning in life. Back to the word that you were saying you didn't like earlier, like, why am I here? What is yeah, my yeah. purpose? Yeah. What is the purpose of all of this? Where are we going? Like choices have felt like they've been taken mm. away. People have got to that place of being disempowered in many cases, but it's also kickstarted a lot of people to start discovering their own empowerment outside of religion, outside of fast cars and sex and money and the celebrity life that we've often been told is what we should be searching for, but have never found that sense of connection within. So many more people are coming into this space and, and looking for something, but how do you see that we can consciously step up and use the celebrity, I suppose you talked about, like, how can we use this space as a real conscious driver for good in the world mm. and making a difference? How, how, how do you see that? We have to lead. So... The wonderful thing, as I said earlier, the, the, the barrier to entry in the, the, an interesting thing has happened, right? So the industry looks like this mm -hmm. with a tiny five to 700 individuals and organizations control 80, 90 percent of all the money, power, influence in this industry um, uh, with the rest shared out amongst everybody else. Mm. It's why of the, again, five to 700,000 or let's even push it like a million or two people who are actively making some kind of money in this industry, whether they are a consultant doing leadership communication skills in corporations or whether they are a, an angel healer channeling from Angel Gabriel yeah. and, and everyone in between, right? That's our, that, that's our industry, right? Um, the, I think that how I see us being able to impact this time is if you want to, you got to lead. Yeah. Like you, you, we, even though the barrier to entry has been lowered, so more people can come in, we are not seeing that top expand. Mm -hmm. It's not, it hasn't at all. And it's because of some of the reasons I said earlier. Yeah. And we think that the technology being open and means that you can make a product for free on your phone this week and put it out doesn't mean it's gonna get bought, why? Because the idea in there doesn't lead. Even mm -hmm. the idea has no leadership, it's somebody else's idea, mm -hmm. or it's your teacher's, but you put your own, you know, your own little swing on it, your own little novelty on it, or, you know, some, some expert taught you that you've gotta have a system that is a, a, an acronym, and that, you know, all these kind of <laughs> things, and it's like, you're just following. Yeah. You're just following when you do that, and I think the, so I think sacrifice, risk, and leadership is what's required. And it's what I'm trying to wake my clients up to is like, you, you think you can do this and not risk something. Yeah, we had this conversation. Yeah, like yeah. you think you could do it and not risk something. Like, and I think this is why people pay but, money. I recently had the thought. But it's why people stay stuck. Yeah. Because they're like, oh, well, I don't like the idea of that risk. No. And I don't like the idea of that risk. And actually, I'm going to have to give something up yes. to get where I want to be. And, and people I don't want to do that. And pay money to not do that. So yeah. what they'll do is they honestly think this, and probably not consciously, yeah. but it is assumed, is that, oh, if you pay, for example... $50,000 to join my mastermind, I'm, and this is never said out loud, but it's no. almost like this al allows you to bypass the risk you're scared of the <laughs> sacrifice that you're being asked to. Pay the money and you get a shortcut. Shortcuts still sell. Yeah. 
The, the problem is there genuinely aren't any shortcuts. Now, there are shortcuts technically. There yeah. are tactical shortcuts. There are strategic shortcuts. But there are no energetic shortcuts. No. There are no energetic shortcuts. So you can... I have seen people take shortcuts tactically and learn, I don't know, how to place an ad well, how to write great copy. And yeah, you should take a shortcut and learn from the best. You should pay some money and learn how to place an ad well. You should learn how to do a funnel and be able to get people, you know, into it well and, you know, all these things. But if you do that and you've taken an energetic shortcut as well... You like can't you, shut your, you, shortcut you know, your journey. It will work for a while. Yeah. And this is why there are so many short-lived people. And, and 20 years in this industry, even just 20 years, has shown me that. Yeah. Is that within the cycles, there are smaller cycles. And generally, two to three years is the maximum life cycle of people that take these shortcuts... But then they take the leadership shortcut as well. Yep. So they're still followers, basically, who are pretending to lead. Um, and that's very childlike. That's very adolescent. And, mm. and we, it, doesn't, it doesn't act as a beacon to the world at yeah. all. It doesn't help anybody. And they'll take tactical shortcuts and fair play to them. But if you haven't done the work, you know... Um, the work. The I lo- work. I love how we call it the work. Like, yeah, but thanks, in a work. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it's um, you know, there's a leader, right? And because because like when we say the work now, we're borrowing from her. Yeah. But the, the when you when you do do that, it will it might work for a couple of years. Like you might make some money. You might do a good launch. You might do. I mean, a bit like, you remember when we first started working together, you were doing something that you clearly weren't put here to do. No, but and I it, was good at. It was good. And you'd get some good months and everything. But you know when you get that sense where you're going, shit, I'm making this money. This seems to be working, but. but. And there's a massive but. And it's like, and you burst into tears. Or you just go, but it's not right. There's something wrong. There's something not. Like, that's all the sign you need. It's like, that's all the sign Pay you need. Pay attention. Yeah, yeah. Pay attention. Pay attention. And I, I can hand on heart but attest to that. Yeah. Like, when you ignore the universe yeah, nudging yeah. you in the right direction, it will slap you, it will bitch slap you, and then it will punch you in the face. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. until you pay attention. <laughs> that's the... There is no... There's no, like, gentle gentle nudge. Yeah, yeah. It gets to the point where it's like, you you have to get on with what, with what you're and doing. I now and I say you to people... Pay attention, if you don't pay attention, it's like, well, that sacrifice that you're trying to avoid will come anyway. And you've sacrificed time. You've yeah. lost time and all sorts of other things. And I, I do think that's an un, unspoken piece of... Probably ties back into the entrepreneurial challenges we were talking about at the beginning. I mean, I'm seven, seven years into my journey with, with EAM. Is it where I want it to be yet? No. Have I learned a shitload of stuff along the way? Oh my God, yes. Yeah, Is yeah. it the biggest personal up leveling in yourself? Like, let alone whatever else you're doing in the world, like the person you have, have to become to be able to continue, even mm. just to keep on going past the two year mark. Cause the first, the first couple of years are actually fun, kind of fun. Cause you're on a journey. Yeah. You're like, Oh, what am I going to learn? And what am I going to do? And blah, 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 and I'm going to change the world. And like, whatever that looks like yeah. for, for us. And then you start hitting challenging times and it's those challenges, same with everything in life, but it is those challenges that actually hone your message that you were talking about earlier, your why, mm. your tenacity, the purpose word, but actually, redirect you just that little bit more like you're not doing the same thing you were doing 20 on the whole like you've maneuvered I've Mm. definitely shifted and and even now I know the next part of what I'm being called within myself to want to do and to tweak where I'm going and what I'm doing and what I'm talking about is completely different to where I started my journey with with EAM seven years ago and I would never have imagined seven years ago that I'd be here and I think that you need to be okay with that. That it's gonna, it's gonna change. You're gonna change. Mm. The world's gonna change, and it's all. It's okay. It's okay to not feel like you have to. So maybe I'm coaching myself now, but it's okay to not feel like you have to follow the same path because so and so said X Y Z. Mm. Like actually move in that new direction when you've gone through that. It's almost like a. What's that thing? You know when you pass, like you've passed that level Mm. of learning within yourself, you open up a whole new doorway where you have completely different clarity about something else that might become clearer to what you've been doing the last five five or six years. And let go, man. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And I think that, I think I'm a fatalist. 
at the end of the day, I think I'm a fatalist. I do believe in the idea. I do feel, let me not say I believe. I feel that there is something to be had as if, I'm not saying that there is a destiny for us all and that fate is a real thing. I'm saying I have found it comforting and accurate when coaching people in this industry to behave as if destiny is a thing. Mm -hmm. Because I think I've experienced a sense of destiny uh, that really started, you know, in the story I said earlier when I was 17 and, and these great changes happened to me. And I think if you behave as if destiny is a thing, as if there is a grand plan for yourself as if there is a as the greeks call it an apotheosis a kind of a, a highest and best you that is to be realized mm -hmm. if you behave as if that's true i think you will tend to you will tend to let go mm -hmm. if you really be, act as if that's true you'll let go of things that aren't for you or your path now the problem the adolescent side of that and where i see this a huge amount in our industry is People don't want to let go of, poss of, of possibility, you know, and potential. Oh, but I could do that and I could do this and I could do that. And I'm like, let go. Because there's an idea that was, again, introduced to me by my fiance, uh, of the, the red ribbon of fate. We love magpies. And there's mm -hmm. a, the, we, we saw this um, uh, Japanese picture and it was a very simple picture of two magpies with the red ribbon of fate in between their claws. And we thought it was beautiful. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and it sort of led me to find out more about that. And I thought, what I see and feel with many of my clients is their denial of their destiny isn't because they don't want to grab destiny. It's because to grab destiny, they have to let go of all these other things they're holding on to. It's a great... This is put so well in a book by Ursula Le Guin, who wrote the Wizard of Earthsea books, these wonderful fantasy fiction books. And she says, I'm going to terribly paraphrase this but there's a scene in the one of the books where this old wizard is talking to a younger mm. apprentice wizard and he says that you know as a man um goes through life the choices available to him become less and less and less until all that's left is his destiny mm. and that's all that you can then be is who you are is who you are supposed to be and i love that um i love that idea and i have found that conducting yourself through life as if that's real whether or not it is or not but conducting yourself as if there is a destiny for mm. you will cause you to be more maybe even and i'm not known for being solemn and somber but will be cause you to be more somber and solemn about the choices you make mm. that means the things you say no to the things you let go of yeah um and Pursue those things that are a hell yes on the way to yeah. apotheosis, the highest and best version of you. And I, that takes leadership. That takes and it's scary. terrible sacrifice. But truly scary. It, it, well, it can be, it can it's, be it's, scary. It's massively I've, I've, scary. I've had to let, I feel like I'm just like, oh, I've had to let, but I think if so many people do not realize that at the beginning, if someone said to you at the beginning of your journey, not necessarily you, but your journey, it's going to mean you might end up leaving a relationship. You have to move house seven times. That your you, health might suffer. That your health might suffer. That you might lose might you. Suffer. That you might lose your business. That you might lose hundreds of thousands yeah. of pounds. That you'll lose friends along the way. Mm -hmm. Like no one ever sets out on that journey to experience those things. But the biggest shifts always, and this isn't just about running a business. This is life in general. The biggest shifts happen on the other side of letting mm -hmm. go of the shit that you think that you need. And when you let it go, the freedom that you've been searching for is often on the other side of that. And it's another level, of course, because you're going to go further along that journey and then there'll be another level. And I, I love that word apotheosis. I'm going to nick that. It's beautiful. <laughs> it's beautiful. I really love what you said there because I, I now, a lot of times people, when they come into this industry, they don't want to hear this stuff up front. They want to hear, you know, about you a can be a, You can yeah. hit your six, seven figures in yeah. the next 25 seconds. Oh, All no you one's have ever to heard do of you. is, yeah. No one's ever heard of you. Here's how to have a membership site with thousands of members. And Within the next 27 like, seconds. All right. No sacrifice. Easy. It's free. Yeah. Buy now. Listen, I've made those infomercials. Yeah. I get it. And, and that promise is wonderful. It's to, a wonderful to promise. To have gain without sacrifice... But the problem is that 
that is literally, to use your word, energetically the opposite of what's required to become a leader in this industry, yeah. which is, it, it isn't easy. Yeah. And, and no, there's going to be sacrifice. The number of people I now go, all right, you want to become, they go, yeah, I want to be speaking to tens of thousands of people in rooms. I want to be doing this. And I go, okay, cool. Which one is it? And they go, what do you mean, which one is it? I said, which one's going to suffer? Your health, your marriage or relationship, your time with your kids. And I go, tell me, tell me which one. And they go, no, I, you can have it all. I'm going to go to the gym and I'm going to make time for things. I'm like, no. Nope. <laughs> and they don't want to hear that. They go, no, come on, you're being negative. I'm like, I'm no. not being negative. You will you sacrifice have to choose. one it's, of them. It's a cho- it, you have to choose. You something. absolutely will. You cannot become a leader in this industry. Um, and people don't want to hear this. You yeah. cannot become a real leader in this industry and not leave something behind. Yeah. And you'll either do it struggling the whole time, like following that red ribbon of faith while still holding on to something. Something will snap. Yeah. It'll probably be your sanity first. Um, we're not sounding very inspirational. Well, but I'm, we're listen, being real. No, I, but I love it. Yeah, I love yeah. it because I'm not it's, saying it's like, the real. It's dump like... your kids and, and scrap your marriage if you want to be a leader. <laughs> I, I, I want to be clear. I'm not saying no, that. I'm not. saying... There will be at least one big sacrifice that will be painful. You would better know what that's going to be. And whenever I question somebody, yeah. it, it's not even a question. Usually in the very early stages of people speaking to me, they already know which one it is. Yeah. They already know. But they just don't want to do the work. Like for me, I came when I came online in 2004, uh, it was, um, you know, the, the, the mother of my kids was, was, was pregnant with Charlotte and... and I knew as 2005 came around and I was building this business, I'd be lying if I, if I didn't say that I knew in the back of my mind this relationship would not cope with this. Mm-hmm. If I kept on this path, I knew that the relationship wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't survive that. And it didn't. Um, and that's not to say... Uh, now, I knew it wasn't the right relationship right from the beginning. Mm. You know what I mean? Like it wasn't, you know, it wasn't my person and all those kind of things. But the, the, the point is... Everybody I meet who genuinely has aspirations to want to make a, a, a difference on whatever, however subtle or significant that is, it really pays to get honest and go, what's the bit that you are kind of praying that house of cards doesn't tumble? Because you know that there is something that is going to be the cost. Mm. Where a lot of people, that's health. You know, their health goes, mental health goes. You know, yeah. I've seen a lot of people literally go crazy in this industry or trying to make it um and it's like you better know going into it that that's the weak point you mm. better know the weak point going and in and in my case i'd be like then we need to do the work on that yeah to to either make the decision because the the lack of in, like from an energy perspective the lack of decision carrying that stuff with yeah. you is going to hold you back 10 million times mm than actually making the choice, like doing the work around whatever that is, whether it's your health, whether it's your relationship, whether it's your fear of success, whether it's whatever, unless or until you address that and let that go, you're dragging that let crap go, with exactly. you everywhere yeah. you go. And that for me is, that's what leadership is for me, is that you are prepared to do the work, that you don't feel like you know it all, that you don't feel like you've got got it all sorted and that you are doing the work, continually doing the work on yourself to let go of the shit that you know is holding you back and be okay with that. And like you said, it's not drop your friends, drop your family, ignore your children. It's not that at all. It's it's just make the conscious choice. Somewhere you're going to have to choose. There's a big cost. It's massive. There's a big cost. Sorry, I know this isn't sounding inspiring or motivating. But Are we inspiring a, you? There's a huge, there is a huge cost coming into this industry. It's, it's working a nine-to-five job. Yeah. I often say this to people. Again, I say like... This might not be for you. Yeah. This might not be for you. It's not just like being a stand-up comedian on a big scale. It, it, these are our sister industries, right? It's like music acting, uh, specifically comedy and music, actually. Yeah. Because I often say comedy and music are l- literal re- relatives of our industry. Yeah. And you often see crossover, actually. You mm-hmm. often see comedians becoming self-improvement type of people yeah. and, and musicians sort of having something to say about it. And the... Because they are dealing with their their own thing, their own intellectual property. They're doing it in a way that is 
right for them, mm. just like we are. You know, they've got their own material they deliver in their own way. We've got our own material that we want to deliver in our own way. They're doing it on a big scale. They, they start out doing it in small scale with just a few people and they grow until they can fill out a hall. And so even some of the product containers are yeah, the same. Totally. You know, you buy an audio of a, com a, com a comedian, just like you might buy an audio, you mm. listening to us now, you know. And lots of comedians do podcasts, you know, and all these kind of things. I go, well, look at, I study those. I really look at those sister industries and I go, where do they, where do we see people break down? Where do, where are people able to hold it together? And it's like, take those warnings, you know, look at some of the, the greatest comedians who die young mm. from health problems. Mm. They have heart attacks, they collapse on stage, they take drugs and stuff like that. And I'm like, those same risks are posed by people in absolutely. this industry. They're, they're absolutely the same things. You know, we see about comedians, you know, some of the best known comedians and like the, the number of marriages that have failed. And I'm like, those same risks are posed by people in this industry. Know them, just equip yourself, yeah. know them and know your weakness, know where your weak spot is. And like do you said, work. do the work. Do the work. Yeah, Thank do you, Bruno. Do work, the work. You know? <laughs> It is, it, and, and for me, that's the leadership piece, it, it is the, the self-awareness, the self-recognition, the realising when your shit's coming up and allowing yourself the time to do the work on it. Be coached, be coachable, be mentorable. Don't feel like you've, you don't have to feel like you've got all the freaking answers. No human being on the planet has. And I, th I think we sometimes give ourselves a bit of a hard time, like, oh, I need to have all this shit sorted out. You don't need to have it sorted out. You just need to be self-aware and make sure that you're not bringing your shit into the space mm. um, and be doing, consciously doing the work. On and realise you probably will anyway. What? You probably still of will course, anyway to a course. certain extent, you know. <laughs> of course you will. But for me, it's the, the fact that you're prepared to do the work, that you are still doing mm. the work and you're prepared mm. to do the work and you're open and, back to Brené again, vulnerable mm. with that in in the work that you do. I think now more than ever, I think the biggest gift the last couple of years, and it was coming before that, is that people aren't prepared to listen to the bullshit anymore. Like you you can't you can't shiny shit your way through this. People want truth, they want real it don't want to use yeah. the word authenticity, but they they want to be with other people who genuinely care, who genuinely have that compassion. The shiny, the shiny life doesn't appeal so much, I think, to people. They want people, people want real people. Well, and people have always wanted real totally. people. But the, that, that piece is massive. And I, I think the facade that you, talk, you were talking yeah. about, any of that facade's disappearing. We saw massively. this about 100 years ago with, you know, out of the, the kind of the highs of the 20s, you know, the booming 20s and everything. And then after World War Two, you know, and, and uh, around 100 years ago, we saw a similar boom in our industry. That's when Think and Grow Rich took mm. off. That's when, you know, How to Win Friends. And, and that has carried all the way through till the Aquarian Conspiracy and, and Unlimited Power and all these, these huge you know, movements, the Jim Rohns and the, the Les Browns and the, you know, the, the Oprah Winfrey, you mm -hmm. know, to, you know, all of the, that has carried through. And the, the, the kind of, I think you're absolutely right. What we've, what we've now seen after the pandemic is one of the things that happens as a result of the pandemic is people mm -hmm. have had times with themselves. Yeah. And Whether so, they liked it or not. Yeah. Yeah. And so we are in the midst in spite of our seemingly gloomy testimony of what's to come or what 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 stands in the way of becoming maybe is a better way of putting it becoming somebody who can really help people on a bigger scale than just somebody you meet in the street um the wonderful thing is we're we're going to be in a boom now for the next 10 20 years yeah that will be the biggest boom in our industry yeah. so now more than ever people are looking for nuance we're, we're seeing that. That's why the explosion of... And people like Joe Rogan, who's a comedian, remember, yeah. right? But these people, like Oprah did it, Joe Rogan did it, you know, the, to name but two. Um, people who weren't gurus, mm. but had an intense curiosity, an intense curiosity, and have become 
globally known names of people who go, here's this person. And what they've shown us is like, there's a person for everybody. Yeah. There's a person for everybody. I often say it's like superheroes. We didn't stop after Superman. Yeah. We just go, there we go. He can do everything. He can build the Great Wall of China with his eyes. He can burn through stuff. He can breathe cold. He can see through and see your underwear. He can read your mind. He can fly. He can dig. He can jump. He can do... Like, <laughs> I don't think even, I saw all those episodes. Even though, <laughs> <laughs> even though he's a hero that's got it all and could do everything, yeah. there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of other superheroes. Some yeah. of them are really random and unknown. Like There's currently one at the time that we're doing this called Moon Knight that is out on Disney+. Plus, right? Like Who'd have thought it? Moon Knight, when I was a kid, was this little known superhero and you thought, well, he'll... Does anyone like him? He's got his own show. <laughs> Moon Knight. Who'd have thought it? You know, there's there's a superhero for everybody. And as cheesy as this sounds, there is a guru for everybody. Yeah. And even though you might not be Superman or Wonder Woman, yeah. there's room for everybody. Totally. And, and that's what's so wonderful about this industry is that, yes, the barrier to entry is low. Great news. And also... Don't worry if you're different, you've got something different to say than the five to seven hundred who rule this industry yeah. that we've been dropping the names of all episode. You know, it's like there's room for everybody. Totally. And so... The, uh, not everyone likes you. Not everyone likes you. No, most people don't. Not everyone likes <laughs> me. And I'm really okay with that. Like, I'm really okay with that. I really am. And, and I think that's a, there's a brilliant book on how, how to... Be okay with not being disliked or something. I can't read off the names. I've got it in there. Yeah. But it's like you do have to get to that point where you're like, I, uh, not I don't care, but I'm okay with you not liking me. I'm I'm good with that. Yeah. I'm actually good with that because yeah. it actually means that I am sharing something that isn't vanilla and it isn't bland yeah. and it isn't the same as everything else. And that's okay if you don't like me. That's cool. Find someone else because there'll be someone else that can help you. Yeah. There'll be someone else that can. And, and if they're help doing you. it well, they'll just help you see yourself. Yes. Just to help you see yourself. Like the the job, you said it right at the beginning. It's like, you know, the, you know that I held up a mirror to you. And it's yeah. like, well, that's, that's literally, that was what was done to me. That's yeah. the original gift given to me when I was 17. That's all I've ever wanted to do for anyone else is just go, I'm going to hold up a mirror to you. Yeah. But I'm going to make you laugh at yourself. I'm yeah. going to make you see how ridiculous you're being in the things you're clinging on to and the, the, the ways you're, you're trying to bypass sacrifice yeah, not everybody likes that. In fact, yeah. most people don't. It, I'd go as far as to say it's like you've got to really be okay with like most people won't like you. Mm. Most people will, will, won't will listen to you. Most people won't do what you recommend. But, you know, all it takes is a thousand raving fans. Yeah. And a thousand <laughs> raving fans, you can make millions. Totally. I love it. I feel like we're coming towards the end. Although I want to sit and talk to you for hours. And I know this is actually, I'm actually quite proud of us. This has been a very grown up conversation. I was expecting loads of swear words. I haven't sworn much at all. No, I've sworn far more. Yeah, far more than than me. I have. But we've actually been very sensible in this episode, which is what I was not expecting at all. Lasting words, end, ending words. What's, what's the philosophy of Mr. Lavers? Okay. Um, Grow up, grab your red ribbon of fate and let go of the rest of the shit and let it let yourself act today as if there is a destiny for you. Mm -hmm. Not just a dream, that's different, right? But conduct yourself today as if there is a destiny that cannot and will not be ignored. And that's a frightening ride towards that. What are you holding on to that is preventing you moving towards that? Start letting go. Um, and as somebody who laughs a lot and laughs at my customers a lot and gets them to laugh at themselves a lot, I would actually say this is actually a very somber thing, which is like take seriously the the life-changing potential of what you have to share with the world. Mm. Tony Robbins didn't know that here was this blushing kid that was skipping school and depressed and staying up till 4 a.m. and sleeping through the day. He didn't know that there was a kid doing that. But he conducted himself as if there was. Mm -hmm. He conducted himself as if there were people even worse than me and he had to reach them. And he did. Mm. And it's like, conduct yourself as if there is somebody out there today who really needs you. Um, 
on the path to your destiny and you'll be just fine. I've got goosebumps. Philosophy of Mr. Lavers. And in 150 years, someone else is going to be sat doing a podcast and say, I remember reading this piece of work. From. <laughs> <laughs> and they'll be like, the great James Lavers. Shit, with I've got to write that book. book. I'm going <laughs> to write, write the, book. the book. I promise I'm going to write the book. <laughs> The when is the question. At some point. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. If thank you, you have loved the show, I will share all of the details underneath um, of how you can find James. You need James in your life is the very, very, very simple answer. He has a lot to answer for, um, both for me and so many other people in the industry that I know that wouldn't be where they are without your loving ass thank kicking you. um, and your straightforward truth. But there's just the profound knowledge and love that you have for, for what we do and the difference that it can make in the world. And I can't wait to see where this documentary comes with, <laughs> with all of these books. And I'm going to come around and I'm going to come around and touch. Let my lads touch them. Yes, do we have to wear yes, white gloves? Yes, your baby. <laughs> we'll see. Do not touch we'll that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but no, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank, thank you, you, James, for yes. being here. It's just been, it's been as always, my awesome to sit and chat to you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye for now. See you soon.